I'm John DeArmond. And I'm Edward. And we're with Coquille Valley Sword Group. And today we're going to be talking about the application of the Haso Hidari Kata. Um, so Haso Hidari is obviously the second kata that we do in Kyoho. And it is the first kata where we really uh, are introduced to cuts, right? In this sort of Kiryotoshi downward cut. Um, but we're going to go ahead and start by going through the direct kata application. In other words, just what the parts in the kata itself are for, and then we'll dive a little deeper. So to review, we're going to do the safety pause version of the kata real quick without commentary, and then go through and break it down bit by bit. So, kata starts off just like all the others, right? This time, we both come to Haso. Whoa! Right? So, what about all that balance your opponent, balance the situation stuff? Is it applied? Is, do we throw it out the window? What's going on here? Basically, the idea is that there are times when tactically the situation does not allow you the luxury of perfectly balancing against one opponent. Um, so while it is tactically better to, to come to a balanced position against one opponent, a lot of times, especially in Musashi's case, you're fighting more than one dude, right? And while the, the low guard, Gaidon, or, or the side guards of Wakigamai are useful in fighting more than one person, Hasso is uh, really kind of the better choice. It allows you a lot more mobility, a lot more sort of fluidity. Um, and this is something that may be difficult to observe when you're just looking at it, but you know, give it a couple months of practice and you'll, you'll start to feel it. So we've come to a matched position, right? We take our steps. Ba, ba, ba. Now, this first part, the evasion, is the same type of evasion as in Sa Sin. The only difference is, is he's waiting, right? So I make that cut, he makes his step, right? And I immediately think, you know, oh, what am, what am I gonna do about this, right? If I've cut here and I come up to cut him, he just drops the cut on me, blam! Takes the arm, takes the sword, he can take the clavicle, the sword, and the arm all in one fail blow if we want. Um, that's another uh, idea in Yoho that we use in our strategy, right? If, if I'm fighting Eddie, right, I never think whoop, that I'm taking just one thing, just his wrist. Um, while that kind of idea, that kind of method is beneficial, especially when you're trying to like draw out as much distance from the dude as possible, right? Whoop. To take him when, when you're still at relatively uh, safe distances. It's, it falls apart when you start working again with somebody who's trying to frustrate your work, somebody who wants to win, um, especially in sort of uh, less than ideal environments, uneven ground where you can get pushed around or, or you have to negotiate with stuff. Or, of course, when you're working against more than one person. Or if the other guy is just a little bit better at you. If, if Eddie's trying to sort of snipe my wrist, right? And I have a method for uh, defeating that work or I'm just lucky or I have some kind of instinctive talent, right? Then this this goes to pot, right? But if his plan the whole time is to hit me more than one place, even with my retreat, even with clearing both my tools and my hands out of the way, he's still getting me. He still has work to drive. And even if I manage to clear everything out, 
uh, he usually just takes me on the center line with that follow-up thrust that we always do. So um, there's a lot of virtue in sort of uh, killing two, three, four, five birds with one stone, so to speak. Um, that being said, don't, uh, don't confuse this to mean that if Hetty's sword is out and I'm swinging at him, that my intent is to sort of cleave through everything down to where my sword comes to rest. That is, that is not the case. If I come in and he hasn't moved, I just foreshorten my cut, right? I don't let it go as deep. Because if I try and bury it in this guy, yeah, you know, I tear through his artery, his heart, and his minor lung, his wrist tendons, and you know, it's, he, he's, he's pretty freaking dead. But now, not only did I have to spend all that effort to kind of he-man my way into him, right? And it does take a lot of effort, right? Cutting stationary targets that are supported is cake, right? Cutting an object in motion, <laughs> it's, it's a whole, uh, an object of mass, is a whole different ball game. And you're just not able to as easily put power into it, especially if the person is not just arbitrarily moving, but actively moving to defeat you. Um, anyway, let's say that I, you know, despite all that, I do and I cleave and brrrp, on one person, this is fine, especially if by some miracle he just goes, ha, ah, and goes into shock and just drops, right? The problem is, I still have my sword in him. Now, uh, human bodies are not like some giant black hole of suction, and I cut into him and I'm, I'm stuck forever, I'm gonna have to push and pull my sword off. That's not how it is. But it's a delay, right? And, and we're dealing with fractions of a second in a fight. Again, against one dude, maybe it's not so important, right? But against more than one dude, that's, it, it becomes a big issue. Um, especially since you've just motivated Bob and Fred and, and George and whoever else to end you as quickly as possible because you just massacred their buddy, right? So, so this step, right? He steps, whoop, whoop. Now, again, if I try and cut into him, he has a host of movement options. He can come deeper in, he can try and get uh, sort of behind my elbow side. Because once you get past the elbow, you pretty much control a person's motion and movement and their, their means of response to you because of how you, you set up the range of your tools. Um, but it's not the only option, right? So we've had one where he suppressed, one where he moved aside, right? I cut, boom. And he's just pulled up into Hasso, poof, and he's made that step. If I try and just centralize real quick, like I do in the kata, with the reverse step, he can tag me. If I try and move forward, he can pivot and tag me. My really, the, the, there are two options here that have any chance of reasonably working against an equally skilled opponent. And again, we try and assume our opponents are better than us, so take this with a grain of salt. I can go, dead backwards, right? I cut, I see, whoop, and I try and void his distance completely. I recognize my error um, because maybe I see the tells of his motion before they sort of germinate into actual motion, and I, I, I bug out real quick. The other option is a, a concept in Hyoho that we call letting go of the sword with both hands, right? And while this can literally mean like letting go of your sword with both hands, it, it mostly means to completely abandon your current strategy in favor of a new one that isn't being, uh, that you're not sort of deadlocked with. Uh, so if I cut, he steps, whoop, I can eat me, right? I can, I can enter in, I can start to control his tools, I can start to take his focus away, I can start to apply <laughs> locks, wrestling, wrestling with the blade, I can work with the blade directly. Um, it might be if, if I am just dead sure that I am fighting this guy one-on-one -on -one and that he doesn't have any buddies lying in the bush or whatever, uh, I might just drop my sword completely, draw my shoto, draw my tanto, draw my, my tessin, you know, his, his, you know <laughs> I might pull out my sode and start trying to sort of hojo him to the ground, right? I've got options there. Um, in the same way, 
that we don't want to focus on the opponent's sword. In other words, his sword is not, it's dangerous, of course, of course, right? But it's not, uh, it's not our mind's focus when we're working because the sword by itself is harmless. It just sits there going, it has potential, but it, it, it doesn't have any uh, motives, any, any motive force behind it. It's the dude, right? In the same way, we don't want to get locked into thinking that our sword, the physical object, is what is the hero here. And we're just kind of like, go to it, Fido, get him, right? And that's not how it is, right? Uh, the weapon that wins the fight is, is you, right? These tools are exactly that. They're just force multipliers. They're a way to take how much pounds per square inch that you make and intensify that by decreasing the surface area, whether on a, a, a plane or a point, right? Or, you know, a bit of a bludgeon, a bit of a bludgeon or whatever, right? So uh, those are kind of your two options for dealing with that step away. Now, um, let's look at how Shidachi responds to that step away. He cuts a step right now, you might be thinking, why doesn't he just cut the dude? He could, right? <clears throat> but it, he cuts me in exactly that moment, and my skill is significantly higher to him, or I have perceived this situation, um, again, sort of before it, it manifests, right? Uh, I can combat it. right? Because then I'm just working in, in second initiative timing. I'm working the same time his blade is. It's not, it's, it's troublesome, but it's not impossible to do, right? On the other hand, because he waits that half beat for me to start moving, to start doing something, he catches me in between the time. In other words, fights, uh, there's a rhythm, right? All fights have a rhythm. And it's kind of like this. T-dum, 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 right? An action, a reaction, an action, a reaction. It has this very even pacing. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. Sometimes the tempo changes, you know, da-dum, 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 dum dum right? But fundamentally, it, it moves in this sort of single beat timing, right? By choosing to work in between those choices, in between those kinds of beats of natural combative rhythm, he gains a great advantage. Because I'm not, I'm, I am in the middle of my processing cycle. My, the time that I'm using to decide what I'm doing or to execute it, right? Whereas normally we get caught on the ends of it, either the beginning before they've made a decision at all, or at the end after they're already working and we're responding to it. So it's, um, it, it, it can seem either super, super simplistic or damn near impossible to pull off depending on how you perceive this, right? Uh, the truth is, is really somewhere in the middle. I mean, once you get a sense for this rhythm in fighting um, and really make an effort to play with it, because a lot of people will talk about, you know, break your opponent's rhythm. And they, they may understand it intellectually, but they have a hard time executing it just because they don't make the conscious choice to practice it, to go, okay, well, I'm gonna work on this guy now and I'm gonna come in a half beat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work in his half beat, right? I'm gonna break him down that way. So it's, it's, it's not a skill that you'll get just by sort of looking at it and thinking about it. You have to, you have to work, right? So I cut, he steps, whoop, whoop, I retreat, whoop, he pins. Now, what's the deal with this pressure, right? Why, why is he pressuring me down? A couple of reasons. One, it gets him used to the feeling in his arms of driving a cut through a person. Because obviously, he's not hitting me full strength. I, it would break my arm, and you know, if it hit me somewhere else, it'd kill me dead, right? Uh, Musashi was kind of well known for just murdering dudes with pieces of wood, and you know, if he had access to polypropylene, I'm sure he would have done the same with it, right? Because it's, it's just a tool. Um, so that way, in the same way with Sasen, where we have our, our partner sort of hold the sword and we work to push them 
to establish a sense of support in our arm, where we can put it, where we can't put it, right? This is the same thing. So if he's up in Hasso, he's guarding his arm, right? This lets me feel, right? Because if I, if I try and come straight down into him, I'll feel uh, this band of tension over the top of my shoulder, right? And my shoulder will try and go up, my elbows will try and go out as I try and sort of ride on top of the back of my ska to push him down, right? And it's, it's uh, if you're attentive to it, you'll, you'll catch it right away as being very uncomfortable, very uh, sort of poor mechanics. Now there are people whose styles focus on this sort of straight downward cleaving, chopping cut, who will say, but John, you know, when, when you hit something as light a target as an arm, and the arm is a very light target as far as fencing goes, you just pop right through it without really any effort because you've got so much force on that tiny area. It's like, oh, yeah, that's absolutely right. But we're only working on the arm here because it's a, it's a safe place to push in the, in the sort of context of this is a training practice. Right? So if I come up to his collarbone all the time, whoop, maybe I screw it up. Maybe I have a bad day. Maybe he comes in a little close and I break his clavicle, right? Well, that artery is right underneath. Maybe my bad luck compounds and that broken clavicle tears that artery. What am I gonna do? I'll be sure to open him up real quick and, and you know, it, it get some, some hemostats on it. It's, it's not gonna work, right? So, we work on the arm, we work with the pressure, just to make it safe. Um, from there, right, shoo, 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 right, he presses, and as always, he follows with that little push. Wah! I drive and retreat. Um, pretty simple, really, really easy. Uh, Let's go ahead and talk about the direct application of the no pause version. Now the no pause version is different in that the cut happens in the same timing. Uh, it can happen in Kendo Sen, in first initiative. Whap! And you can just be walking to the dude, bop, bop, and you can hit him the moment he starts to think about hitting you, right? Catch him, I caught him kind of deep because I'm trying to throw him, right? And, and drive in that kind of fashion. Or, right, bada, and you can take him, again, Ken no sin. The moment he starts to go, ah, it's about, boom, you hit him, All right? But for the kata, we're working in, in the second edition at the same time. So we start off, one, two, three, yoop, and he cuts me at the same time, right? Now, we just got through saying, hey, you know, the, the person can counter that. You know, so why would we practice it this way? Well, the answer is we don't really so much. I mean, it depends on the instructor and the student. But um, even if it's not an effective situation uh, for us, it's common. It's super, super common. People just, we fall into that rhythm and we're like, oh, it's the beat. We're doing stuff now. Boop. Oh, now it's the next beat. Oh, now it's the beat, right? and we just naturally fall into it. So it's important to understand how you can use that. And the first, the fundamental uh, lesson with these uh, two katas in respect to this working in the same time is real simple. Get out of the way, right? Don't be in the way of his sword because if he hits you, you're gonna die, most likely, right? If not then in the battle, then from his buddies or from infection, or from, you know, just the fact that you're maimed and weaker in a society that was predominantly predatory, you know, if we're talking about ancient Japan. So, um, so there's a lot of value in learning how to work in that bad situation, right? Now, this is where we come to the, the direct line variant. And most of the Hyoho Katas have a, a direct line variant. In other words, one in which I do not come off the line. These are uh, not very commonly taught. Uh, just because, again, we want to train our students to capitalize on the best possible position, to get in the habit and to work towards, okay, I can, I can always come to a strong position that 
puts everything to my advantage and everything to his disadvantage, right? Because it's better and we always want to go to that highest level. But, of course, reality doesn't always go along with our plans. We can't always just say, oh, invading army, I want you to pause there. I've got my supply lines over here all sheltered and control. I've got this, you know, my, my fort ready for siege. We're good to go. Okay, now, now, now you can come and cross this marsh full of gasoline that I've set up. You, you have to fight where you end up fighting, right? You don't have a lot of choice. And so being able to work in those rough situations is an important skill, and that's what this is, right? So direct line variation. So I'm going to attack, and he's just going to come straight in, right? But if we keep this sort of straight body position and we both cut, of course, we're going to kill each other. Mutual destruction. It's very bad for us, right? So what we need to do is fix the problem. Right? We don't want to just uh, use our action to block because this puts us in that reactive position to where we have to sort of constantly respond. And if we're better than the dude, maybe we can get away with this if there's one guy. But people get lucky, right? And you, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want your life to depend on luck and just sort of forestalling yourself, not even their work, right? So, what do we do, right? We have to, if we're not stepping out of the way, we're attacking them in the same time, and we don't want to waste our time blocking, how do we solve this? By cutting them better. This better cutting idea is, uh, it is common, uh, it's as common as anything in Koryu, in, several styles of traditional Japanese fencing. It's common in European schools of fencing. It's, it's super common. It's, it's super common. It's, it's the Gao of Jit Kune Do, right? The way of the intercepting fists to block and punch in one motion. It's the same, it's the same, same thing, right? And so what's Eddie going to do? He's going to throw that same cut, but he's going to go into Koshimi Hanmi. Doing this changes his hips, which changes his shoulders, which changes his arms and his swords and the relative relation and interplay between the two of us. So as I cut, bah, 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 my sword is harmlessly cammed off to the side as he cleaves me into biddles, right? So um, it's, it's real simple, right? I'll try and line this up. So, ah, forget it. Right. <clears throat> if I cut here, everything that is not on this one line is fair game. Like that's, you know, at 300 and, and some odd degrees of open space available for them to move and strike me for their tool to come in at me, right? When I make that same cut and turn, right? Whether I'm coming in Kesegiri, whether I'm dropping in that Kiryotoshi, the downward cut at the last moment, right? In either case, I create a kind of uh, natural geometric defense, right? I create basically a slip and slide that takes his sword away from me, right? And this is, this is super important, uh, so important again, that we'll see it in the last kata, Aise no Chidome, um, as kind of the, the the tail in the tail marker of of Hyoho, uh, and for the touch sail, I mean. So um, with that basically out of the way, we're going to talk about some other applications: applications with a knife, applications with open-handed work. Um, so you can get a well-rounded sense of what this Hasso thing is all about. So, some stuff I forgot to mention about Hasso. Uh, it's kind of important before we go on. Uh, we talked about the direct application of this stuff. Let's talk about some of the stuff that is not so visibly apparent on the surface, right? The first is that whole going into Hasso thing, right? Why do we do this? What, what, are, we, what are we doing here? What's going on? Well, we are learning how to defend ourselves against this same cut at the same time, right? 
It's our second kata. We're just learning how to cut, but we're also learning how to actually parry it, right? Now, the parry is, is hidden in that haso, uh, how we go into haso no kamae, right? Um, so if he comes to cut me, blah, 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 here, I come into haso. In that same camming parallel beside his sword, right? Because if I'm driving in and I bring it to the side, my sword has made an angle, right? It's like one side of a triangle that cams their attack off. Again, I am not uh, hitting his sword to the side. I'm not striking it. I'm not giving it uh, any additional motion necessarily. Now, just like anything else, this kind of has levels. In the beginning, um, we're just responding, right? We're, we're just coming beside it and working. In the end, whoop, we thrust and can do the same work. Uh, we can start applying work found later in the katas uh, in the same kind of way, in which I use my mune to strike his mune real slow. Bop, 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 bop. We come beside. And again, at this point, right, I'm, I'm real safe, right? I've got that, that, that triangle of safety. As the cut is going, he can't hit me. He's got to change his orientation, change how he's throwing his cut, mid cut to be able to do it, right? Um, you know, and when we're working in slow practice, it's entirely possible to do, right? You're, you're working in your dojo with your friends, right? They, they can thwart this work real easy, right? But when you start working more uh, robustly, right? More almost competitively, right? Then it's much harder for people to, to sort this, especially when you use that sort of attacking in the same motion. It's the same basic idea. Once I'm safe, I can cut in and take him just right blah, 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 away uh, with, with almost no danger to myself, um, comparatively, of course. So it's, it's a very useful part of the Haso Kata. And, and I say hidden. I don't mean like intentionally obscured. It's just, it's there, it happens. Um, a lot of times where it will happen is in that bottom section, right? I've cut, he's stuck, I parry, right? And we move on, right? I see that, oh shit, I've screwed up. I parry him to the side. Again, I'm using the flat of my blade to parry on whatever surface happens to be available. Most of the time, if he's cutting down at me, or if he's cutting even uh, kesegiri, uh, diagonally, I'm encountering his shinogiji, the, the, the flat of the back, right? Sometimes, if he's, if he's really trying to cut in hard to my blade, I'll end up cutting, or not cutting, but parrying with the G of my sword, the flat of my sword against the G of his sword. Right, uh, G just means surface. Uh, so this, this kind of quick, oh shit, parry is, is quite common in, again, pretty much all types of fencing. Um, but the concepts behind it, why it work, this parry is the same as the center line cut they, they function based on the same principle of sort of geometric safety, right? Um, so they're the same, they're the same. It's just one's a defensive application and one's an offensive application. And once you play with that a little bit and start to understand it, it's, it's a very powerful concept um, that you could easily build an entire style around. Um, we don't have to do that because we have Hyoko, right? <laughs> okay, so now we're really gonna move on to some open-handed work and some knife work. So let's look at some applications for Hasso, uh, for the concepts of Hasso using other tools, simple tools, 
we'll start off with Tonto. So what's the, the first thing that we really come to in, in Hasso, right? It's, it's get out of the way, right? So if Eddie, Eddie wants to work on me or whatever, right? So he comes to attack however he wants, doesn't really matter, right? What do I do? Yes, I, I engage his hand, but I'm not applying a lot of force. I'm not even necessarily seizing it, right? Uh, if I do grab, I tend to grab it without the use of my thumb. Now, a lot of people will like say, clam -clam. yeah, like a little clammy clam that, you know, they can, they can rip out and cut you. And this is 100% this is true, 100% true and valid. Um, but it's, it, the, that danger is much less than the danger posed by grabbing it. Uh, when, you, when people grab with their thumb, full on monkey grip, they tend to kind of anchor their mind and their hand in that position. And they think like, this is where I live now. These, these are neighbors forever. I'm gonna work at this job for 20 years until I get retirement kind of thing. Blah. And it, it retards your ability to adapt to the situation. And so as a general rule, I just don't even bother with it. And honestly, even working with people from lots of different knife fighting traditions, it's, it's gripping with this sort of clamshell, no thumb, has never caused me problems. And if my individual experience matters, then that's all that matters, right? You know, use your own experience. Your mileage may vary, of course. But yeah, you know, he swings at me, and I get off the line. So here, I got off the line, but I also used that hustle block, right? <gasps> right? <laughs> it's the same. It's the same. I just went right in the attack with it. So as he cut, right? <laughs> Again, I get behind his elbow so I can control him. So as he starts to cut and work at me, right? All I have to do is match his body placement, right? Still good, too. And I can, <laughs> and I can, you know, I can play. Of course, keep in mind that what you're doing is fundamentally with friends and it, it doesn't have the same stress level as, as working a dude when you have to. So uh, fancy stuff like that is, is fun for, for class. And it's, it's good to build some skill, but uh, keep your work simple when it counts. Um, so yeah, this, this getting beside the person, right? I can do the same thing coming down, right? He's cutting, I come behind his work, and I'm bringing it to the side. It's the same idea. I'm using a motion that does not directly oppose his force to cam his force away. Yeah, you're just moving it, I'm sort of gently shuffling it aside and clearing space for either my, my safety or my work, right? So what about this half beat thing? How do, you, how do you work in the half beat? What does that look like? Right, well he attacks, right? Bum, and he attacks, bum, bum. And there it is, right? In the half beat, right? Be gentle with your partners. <laughs> so nice and slow, he attacks. I respond, I wait for him to attack again, and I get him in the response. I let him kind of think that he's faster than me. In other words, if I'm the bad guy and I'm attacking Ed, I make my first cut and it doesn't land for whatever reason. And before he attacks, he's gonna wait, right? Cause you're doing on the half beat, right? And I think, okay, shit, here it comes. Cause if he attacks me right away, what do I do? Right, right? I, I, I take him, I, I take radial check, and then I start moving into the tendons on the elbow, right? Pop, 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 pop. Just like a paintbrush that only paints in one color, right? But if I attack and he doesn't move right away, I think, okay, I got this fool. So either I, I come in and try and work and he stops me or I try and evade and he just follows through and takes me. There is, there is so much virtue in working in that half beat and being able, it's, it's a reward for patience, right? Because everybody wants to win, right? Because especially in this kind of situation, not winning is not a really good alternative. But 
If we let our desire to win drive us and be our sole guiding force, then we're going to have a rough time because our want for that winning is going to make us try and 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 just go 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 and against somebody who is not as skillful as you, you can get away with that, right? Because um, you can get away with most things against people that are less skillful than you. But if the person is better skilled or just in a better situation tactically, they can take you because you're a freaking goat being led around by a carrot, right? He knows I want to win. He knows that I'm going to do everything I can to want to win. If I show him that I am mindlessly following my want to win, he can control me, right? And, and easily, easily to take me, um, which is bad for me, but powerful for him because maybe I'm the big bad guy, right? And I'm just, I mindlessly want to win, right? And he's at the disadvantage, right? But by understanding my motivations and how I'm working, he can just completely flip the scales and I could be bigger, stronger, have all the friends in the world, maybe not all the friends in the world, but he can still, he can still prevail because he's got that tactical strength, which is, it's important. It's super important. Um, that's not to say that uh, technical strength or, or physical strength is not important, uh, but all things being equal, tactical strength plays a larger role in certain victory, right? So uh, we've talked about the parallel pass. We've talked about waiting for that half beat. Let's look maybe, um, we did the thrust follow through with Sasen. Um, let's talk about this cut, this cut that we're using, right? So in a lot of methods, uh, the idea that you're going to chop at the person is very common, right? He cuts at me, boom and I chop him, bah, strong, just cleave through, bah, and take him, right? Will it work? Absolutely, especially when I'm working against light targets, right? Or even if I'm coming in deeper, I'm trying to get that brachial artery or whatever, you know? If, yeah, it's, it's not, it's, it's real close to the surface. You just have to, you know, come between the bicep, right? Um, but, I'm not always working against these soft targets. A lot of times, uh, I'll work in deep. Now, it depends on how I'm feeling. If I'm scared, right, if this guy is like, like, oh my god, that's some ninja shit right there, right, I'm going to work at a place, at a distance, that I can do my best work and be comfortable, right, uh, if I have the option. You don't always have the option. You could have me in a corner or whatever. Um, but what that means is that as he cuts me, uh, right, I start bump, and working at the farthest possible thing. I go to where he can't possibly reach me, and, and, I, and I chide him. I, I chide him with my, my tool, whatever it is, right? Just like, bah, 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 right? But this, all this work does is improve my relative position, right? If he started out way better, and I brutalize the crap out of his hands, kind of in an advantage now because he's got to work with his offhand and he, he knows that I'm rough. But here's the thing. I can carve his hands up until they are nubs and I still might not win. If he wants to get me, he can get me. Sharpened nubs. With sharpened nubs. Jesus. <laughs> um, in extreme situations. And that's what we, we train for is extreme situations. A normal dude, right? Normal Billy Bob out on the street. Oh, I'm gonna get you for my crack money. Oh shit, right? That, that's it, right? They, they, even if it doesn't kill him, he recognizes that this, this, this was a miscalculation on my part and I need to reassess this interaction at least, right? But. There's always those guys who are just like, nah, this is happening. I'm happening to you, right? And so uh, you need to be able to work and drive and push in the, the core of their body in a way that isn't just hacking. Because if I come to Eddie, right, and I just start hacking at him, I'm, I'm causing a lot of pain. I'm giving him 
Yeah, I'm getting a lot of burn, you know, give him his cool scars for his, his uh, bar stories or whatever. Yeah, you know, we all got them. Um, I'm not ending the fight. I'm not resolving. All I'm doing is saying, hmm, we both have a chance to kill each other. I did something that I know won't kill you. Right? And hoping that he does the same or something else. It's, it's a bad plan. It's a bad plan. So instead, right, as he's working or whatever, poof, right, I come right in. Right? Ba, ba, ba. Body motion. Support. Follow through. Follow through. Cutting into him, not onto him. Big difference. Big, big difference. Right? Um, which you don't know about if you don't play and push people and fight with Fukuro Shinai and give some, give some work. Right? So, what does this kind of stuff look like open-handed, right? <laughs> so if uh, he's coming to work at me, however, right? I'm just coming to the side, right? Can I work? Yeah. However I, however I am comfortable, whatever the, the method that I've worked in. Um, it's, it's real simple, real simple. Um, and of course, just like we talked about in Sasen, uh, this is not meant to be a, I have stepped perfectly, just like the kata. Right? While that can be an example of the concept, right? I have both the haso block, I have the stepping off the line, and I've got working in the half beat. It's not necessarily, uh, well, it wasn't really in the half beat, but you get the idea. It's, it's, that isn't all there is, right? It's the idea, right? So if he's working on me, Right, I can come to the inside, same thing. So he punches slow, ba -da 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 -da. I cover that lead hand, and now maybe he checks me, right? He's, he's checked this whole thing, ba -ba -ba. And, and I just continue my work. And what are those last three pieces of motion? They're the thrust. They're the follow through along the center line. It's the same thing. And getting into that, Understanding, it's the same. The microcosm mimics the macrocosm. The big is the small, they are one thing. That is a key to Kyoho strategy, right? That is, you know, we learn here so we can apply to everything else, right? Um, half beat, right? He's working me, however, right? <laughs> it's maybe in range. Right, and you catch him in the half beat, right? So what is the half beat there? He one and two, oh. it's in the transition. It's in the, the liminal space, the space in between. Um, and again, let's say you're, let's say that you are not uh, inclined to striking, right? While Hyoho's technical work is definitely more striking oriented, um, we can still grapple. We can still do takedowns and throws and joint locks and breaks and all that nonsense. Um, not nonsense because it's nonsense, nonsense because it's just fun tools in our toolbox, right? So if Eddie's coming for me, right? One, two, right? <laughs> One, two, no. three, right? And so the attack comes, boom, and then he starts to move back to get space. One, two, three, and around and down, right? Um, and that's just, it's just an example. The, the specific technique is not important, right? The specific technique of haso, of sasen, are not important. What's important is the underlying concept and to sort of, uh, be able to see that and apply it to whatever you do. So if you're a jujitsu guy and you can throw way better than I can, which is obviously not very good, <laughs> then you just do your work, right? If, if, you're, uh, if you're a Wing Chun guy or girl, right? You just do your work. It's the same whatever you already do. Let's say you're a person that doesn't have any technical work. You have work, you just don't know it, right? Let's say you make a fist, he comes to hit you, right? And you just reach for a teacup in your closet, 
or your closet, your cupboard, cupboard. right? Just boom, boom, just that easy. So you want to, uh, right? Uh, and I open the door, right? Boom, I reach for, you know, something on a high shelf. Bah. It's, it's not like there's some witchcraft to it, right? Use a motion that's natural and comfortable for your body and try it and go, oh, I tried this thing on this dude. It didn't work at all, right? Well, analyze it. Did it not work because the work sucks? Because you didn't do the work well? Or because, you know, the other guy was just way, way better and the time was inappropriate, right? Analyze it and adapt, right? And fix and, and grow and all that, right? So I think that's about it for those kinds of applications. Um, rather, than, rather than spend each caught application video and have a segment talking about uh, social examples or large scale battlefield examples like we did with Sasin, I'm gonna, for the sake of brevity, leave that to you guys to work out on your own. But you can always go back to the Sasin video application and, and watch that and then sort of like, oh, and you, like a little uh, stamp, go, okay, like this, but like that, right? Um, let's see, I think that's about it. Do you have any, any comments on also? Okay. So, as always, the key to all of this stuff, if you want to be good, is to, or if you want to understand it at all, really, is to pick up a sword and go train. Mm -hmm.